All right, we're recording. Awesome. So uh, I was looking at chapter four, and to be honest with you, uh, I think really I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on chapters six and seven, because chapter four is just stoichiometry, and the beginning of it was what's a strong acid, what's a, a strong base, memorizing what those things are, and I, I think um, you guys have that down pretty cold. The other thing from chapter four was balancing oxidation and reduction reactions, which you know how to do quite well. Um, and then it's stoichiometry, which you know how to do very well. Uh, so the only real thing is maybe a hydrate. Anybody, again, don't use your names, but anybody remember what hydrate is? Well, hydrate is water. <laughs> you're, you're right. Uh, a hydrate is a crystal that's got water in it. So if they um, write something like this, um, sodium chloride, big dot, five waters, this is uh, a sodium chloride crystal with water trapped inside. So there are, you've got your crystal, and if there's water trapped inside the crystal, we call it a hydrate. If there's no water trapped inside the crystal, like this one, there's no water in there, then we say it's anhydrous. And the number of waters trapped inside the crystal depend on the, um, the ionic compound. Salts, as you know, are anything that dissolves. Uh, I mean, salts are, I mean, are ionic compounds, salts are ionic compounds. So, the anhydrous is the crystal without water. Without water, yep, so it would just be pure sodium chloride. How come it doesn't? Uh, so, most crystals do trap water in it. No, I mean, how come it doesn't um, dissolve? No, I, I no, that, that's not what I said. I don't know. I, I said. I see that on water. How come it doesn't oh, dissolve? this is so. If I have sodium chloride and I just sit it out, okay? Mm -hmm. There's humidity in the air, oh. and so some of the water in the air goes into the crystal. Okay. But if I put sodium chloride into a beaker of water, it will dissolve. Yeah. Yeah, that's really. Yeah, I, I don't really think there's anything else. Um, to earth shattering here. Uh, so I'm going to move on to chapter 5. Because we reviewed balancing oxidation and reduction in chapter 17. Sure, you know the difference between ideal gas theory and real gas theory. So, an ideal gas we would say is a point mass, which means it has mass but no volume. Whereas a real gas takes up space and body. Another component of ideal gas theory is that ideal gases, they um, have elastic collisions, which means no energy is lost during the collision. So normally when two things collide, there's some sort of heat generated and you're going to lose some energy that way. So some of the, because you've got kinetic energy of this guy moving, kinetic energy of this guy moving, 
when they collide, the total energy should be the sum of the two. But when they collide, actually it's less because some of the energy is converted to heat. But for elastic collisions, we pretend that no energy is lost. And you guys can interrupt me too if you have a question. Like, like what do I mean? And the third question. Mr. Martin, please call 4404. Mr. Larson, please call 4404. Random motion. We assume that the gas particles are moving independently of each other. So then obviously with real gases, it's just the opposite. Um, collisions aren't elastic. Motion is not random. Because gas particles can attract each other if they get close enough. Or if it's a polar gas. Like if you're talking about water vapor in the air, H2O is polar. So if you've got two water molecules floating around in the air, if they get close enough, their dipoles are going to attract. The ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT, whereas the real gas equation is... Uh, P plus A N over V squared, or we can just say N squared over V squared, times V minus N B equals N R T. That's an A. That's an A. Okay. So, these two terms, A, N squared over V squared, and minus NB, due to the fact that we are taking into account these factors. So because gas particles actually take up size, take up space from point number one, we have to subtract out the space that the um, gas particle occupies. So B is the size of the gas particle. And B is the basically the number of moles. So if I so the more gas particles you have, the more space they're going to take up. And then you multiply it by their size. What is A? Uh, I'll get to A. So if I was going to ask you which has got the largest size, which gas particle has got the largest size? Hydrogen, oxygen, or iodine? Well, let's not do iodine because sometimes it's liquid. So uh, let's do chlorine. Which one's bigger? Chlorine. Chlorine. Chlorine's in the third energy level, much bigger than oxygen, but second bigger than hydrogen, but it's in the first. So it's got the biggest B value. So which one is going to act the most, the most non-ideal? An ideal, we pretend all gases are the same size. When it's real, then we take into account their size. So the one that's going to behave the least like an ideal gas is the one that's the biggest, so the chlorine. A has to do with the fact that the collisions aren't elastic and that the motion isn't random. And it has to do with how pressure is created. When a gas particle strikes the side of a container, that's how pressure is created. But if the gas particles are more attracted to each other, <coughs> if they're attracted to each other, they're not going to hit the uh, balloon or whatever the wall of your container with as much force. So that's going to affect the pressure. So A basically is for the attractiveness of the gas. How attracted are they to each other? N 
and then the n squared over v squared, that has to do with the concentration. Would you be able to predict A without being without looking it up? You could predict A relative strength. Like of the gas, like the specific gas, is there a trend on the peri periodic table? For the most part, yes. You know, um, you could predict it now. The way you actually get A is by doing an experiment with finding the actual number. But relatively, you could predict um, pretty good. Um, What's the trend on the periodic table? There is no trend on the periodic table. Oh. The, 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 what it's based off of is really polar or nonpolar and size of the molecule combined. Um, N is the moles, V is the volume. So if you have lots of moles in a small volume, you can have a very dense concentration of gas, so there's going to be a greater attraction. Um, if you have very few moles and a very big volume, well then, the gas particles aren't going to be very close to one another, and therefore the attraction will be smaller. Now, as far as your question goes, predicting, suppose we had um, uh, these gases, um, carbon dioxide gas, ammonia gas, and um, sure, why not? Water vapor. And no, let's leave water off. Let's just do um, CO2, NH3, and H2. So who's gonna what which gases are gonna be most attracted to each other? Uh, well, we know a little bit about that dipole dipoles are going to be more attractive than um, non-polars. So if I do the um, Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide, this is what I get. This one is symmetrical. Carbon dioxide is non-polar. So if another carbon dioxide molecule comes nearby, there's nothing really to attract these two together. Similarly, hydrogen. Hydrogen is nonpolar. So there's really nothing that's going to cause one hydrogen molecule to be attracted to another. But ammonia has a lone pair of electrons. And that lone pair of electrons is going to make this side partially negative and this side partially positive. So ammonia gas does have a reason to be attracted to another one. The partial positive on one side is going to be attracted to the partial negative. So the one that would have the greatest attractive forces is going to be the ammonia. negative on one attracted to partial positive on Now if I am, um, there is a little bit of an attractive force between one carbon dioxide molecule and the other. What is that force when it's two nonpolars? What attracts two nonpolars together? London dispersion or Van der Waals. So you've got London dispersion or Van der Waals. And essentially, all you're saying with these is that the electrons in one molecule are attracted to the protons in the other. Okay? But because the electron density is, I've already drawn a cloud, the electron density is equally distributed. And because the electron density is equally distributed, um, one side of the molecule doesn't have a partial negative. But when you draw the electron density of, let's say, ammonia, the electron density cloud looks like 
that one side of the molecule has a lot of negative charge due to the electrons. So the electron cloud in this one is attracted to the protons in the other molecule. And because it's symmetrical, there is not much of an attraction. Now if I were to compare carbon dioxide to hydrogen, hydrogen is a very small molecule. Its electron density is equally distributed. The bigger your molecule you have, the greater the likelihood two molecules will bump into each other. And even though this is nonpolar, the bigger your molecule, the greater the attraction. Okay? So CO2 has very little attraction, but it will have more attraction than the hydrogen. So this would be to this would be the So London dispersion is just the electrons and protons just aligning? Kind of. No, I wouldn't say aligning. Well, but not, but they, just like they attract to each other. other. Okay. Yeah. But because there's no like unequalness, 